Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cybers webinar series for spring 2022. I'm Tina Lee, Cybers' User Engagement Officer. Our webinar today is presented by Joel Parker on the biostatistical optimizations they've incorporated into Shunpiker R, a Python-based pipeline for app for single-cell RNA-seq analysis, which was developed by Dr. Bonnie LaFleur's team here at the University of Arizona and her collaborators. To see our spring webinar lineup, please visit our webinars page at www.cybers.org. Many of you use Cybers and know that we are an NSF-funded cyber infrastructure project whose mission is to build and deploy a national computational research infrastructure for life sciences. This free webinar series is designed to fulfill an important part of that mission, which is to train, train researchers and educators how to use Cybers as computational researchers. And let me tell you, I know how critical that is because one registrant said on their registration forum that what they most wanted to gain out of this webinar was how to be less afraid of cybers. <laughs> so I know people need to learn how to do this. Please do reach out to us um, if you do need help. Let's first take care of some housekeeping and then Joel will take over. Uh, today's webinar is about 35 minutes long with time at the end for your questions. Please be sure to open the Zoom chat window and type your questions in there. Joel will answer them after his presentation. All of our webinars are recorded and I'll post this video recording on our website webinar page in a day or so. Uh, we now have more than 60 webinars organized into playlists on science, technology, and cybers platform topics to help you learn and do your science. So please don't be afraid of cybers. Um, okay, so let's get on to the webinar. Uh, Joel Parker is a PhD candidate in biostatistics and works in Dr. Bonnie LaFleur's lab at the University of Arizona, where he helps their team build statistical pipelines. Joel's research interests include Bayesian modeling, single cell RNA seq data, and non parametric modeling. Besides Joe and Bonnie, other contributors to the app's development in their team include Dr. Xiao Xiao Sun and Bonnie's collaborator, Dr. Anastasia Kusa of Sloan Kettering Institute. So welcome, Joel. Let's get going. Awesome. Great. Um, just want to say hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm truly ecstatic to be able to uh, use the Cyverse platform to uh, share some of the research that we've been doing. Uh, I'm a first year biostatistics PhD student. I'm working on statistical methods for single cell data, and I'm part of the DARE work group. And DARE stands for Data and Analytic Research Environment. And I'm working under the supervision of Dr. Zhao Zhao Sun and Dr. Bonnie LaFleur. And uh, I'm here to present our Cyber Shumpiker app for single cell data analysis. But before I do that, I really need to give a huge shout out to our collaborator, collaborator from the Sloan Kettering Institute, Dr. Anastasia Kusa. Um, her contributions to this project have been vital um, and we're really appreciative of the work that she has done. Uh, also, this app provides a place for researchers to bring their data and streamline their analysis with cutting edge methods in single cell research. Today, I'm not only going to demonstrate our Cyverse app, but provide information on single cell RNA sequencing analysis for those of you who may be new to this field. And for those of you with more experience, I also want to be able to provide justification and explanation for some of the methods that we use in single cell RNA sequencing analysis. But before we do that, I wanna talk about Cyverse. Um, so in the life sciences, we often find ourselves with massive data sets that need computationally intensive tasks that allow us to gain inference to, from our data. The Cyverse Cyber infrastructure provides solutions that we face in large scale computational science while also providing a user web-based interface, user-friendly web-based interface. Uh, Cyverse has made it possible for researchers worldwide to attempt problems that were previously impossible due to computational constraints. And with the Cyverse discovery environment, researchers can utilize their storage of their data and this data can be private, it can be shared with researchers and it can be shared with the community. And then researchers like myself have access to a large amount of community data to test their methods on. In Cyverse, the analyses are done utilizing their Cyverse apps. Currently, there's hundreds of open source apps to help you analyze data in Cyverse, 
And if you would like to make updates to these current apps and you are familiar with Docker, it is pretty straightforward to make changes to the apps and then upload a new custom app specific for the analysis that you're trying to complete. And then these apps never change, making it pretty easy to reproduce the analyses that were completed in the app. And then one of my favorite things about Cyverse is the community atmosphere that they've helped to foster. They host webinars like this one and provide opportunities for their users to grow as researchers. When I was first learning how to create the apps in Cyverse, I, I was able to utilize their chat support and chatted with a live person and we came to a solution to the problem that I was facing in a minimal amount of time. Uh, for these reasons, I believe Cyverse is an excellent place to perform single cell data analysis and why our DARE work group uses, it, uses Cyverse to build our reproducible pipelines. So now I wanna talk about our DARE work group. Again, DARE stands for Data and Analytic Research Environment. And we are a team of researchers that are working under the supervision of Dr. Bonnie Lafleur. Our mission can be summed up with three major directives. The first directive is to develop user-friendly computing and analysis environments to facilitate cross-collaborative research. We're going to see an example of this today with our Shunpiker Guide to Single-Cell RNA Sequencing Data Analysis. The second directive is to support current externally funded research that has highly multivariate and complex data integration. So in other words, our group can provide statistical help for challenging problems which may need expert advice. And then the third directive is to develop novel methods for analysis and computing to gain prominence and demonstrate expertise nationally and internationally. I will provide, I will provide examples of this directive today throughout the webinar. Our DARE work group uses a concept of team science. Team science can be defined as the collaborative effort to address scientific challenges in a way that leverages the strength and expertise from professional and diverse fields. For multidisciplinary projects, documentation is a central step for the success of the overall group. For documentation, we use Gitbook. Which, you, which provides a central location for collaborators to go and find information on the various projects that we're working on, including links to resources that we created, like a link to the app that we're going to be discussing today. Another essential, essential aspect of what we do is reproducibility. Now, when we're talking about reproducibility, we're really talking about three different types of reproducibility. The first one, is data reproducibility. The second one is computational reproducibility. And then the third one is statistical reproducibility. For data reproducibility, we follow the FAIR guiding principles. FAIR, F-A-I-R, stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. We are able to follow these principles with Cyverse through the data store where we can secure large-scale data storage and retrieval. We have computational reproducibility through the use of RStudio, RShiny, and Jupyter Notebooks, and can be accessed through the Cyverse discovery environment. Cyverse also uses containerized workflows for their apps, which helps to also ensure computational reproducibility. And then last, but certainly not least, we also, um, focused on statistical reproducibility. This is done through the use of good statistical practices and also by providing the availability to source code with well-documented instructions. So now that I've introduced our group and the Cyverse infrastructure, let's dive into why we're really here. And that's single cell RNA sequencing. Single cell RNA sequencing is a next generation sequencing method that allows researchers to see transcriptomic profiles in thousands of cells. This allows us to see tissue diversity at a resolution much higher than traditional bulk RNA sequencing. The end-to-end -end workflow starts by taking a sample of living cells, for example, a tissue from a cancer tumor or a blood sample. Each cell uh, each cell in the sample is then isolated and cap captured using an encapsulation method. The encapsulated cell is assigned a unique barcode, allowing the transcript to be mapped back to the encapsulated cell. This process is, 
critical step to remember for single cell RNA sequencing data analysis. And we will discuss more about this step when we talk about quality control. After cell isolation, sequencing technologies like SmartSeq2 and Chromium 10X are used to generate, generate the FASTQ files which contain the raw reads. In Cyverse, there is an app which utilizes the Cell Ranger software to read these FASTQ files and generate the read count matrices in the downstream analysis. Information about this app will be found in our Gitbook documentation. The read count matrices contain the number of times each gene appeared in each cell, and that's here. Now, one thing that I wanna talk about in these read, uh, read count matrices is the number of zeros. So here, here, and here. A zero in a data set can occur for two different reasons. The first is a biological reason. The gene did not appear in the cell. The second reason is a technical reason, meaning the gene does exist in the cell, but was unidentified due to some step in creating the data. Now these issues have led to sparse data leading to the development of novel statistical methods explicitly used for single cell RNA sequencing. Once the read count matrices has been created, we can then begin to analyze the data for our specific hypothesis. In this webinar, we're mainly gonna focus on a workflow for clustering our data. Now, before we talk about clustering our data, we need to talk about quality control and normalization. One of the fantastic things about single cell data is that it allows us to see cell to cell variation in gene expression, which may be a driving force in tissue functionality. However, one drawback with this is that with increased resolution comes increased noise and bias. Proper quality control and normalization of single cell RNA sequencing data will allow researchers to increase the signal to noise ratio, providing better insights from our data. Now quality control can occur in several places of a single cell experiment. To clarify, the quality control and normalization discussed here is starting from the read count matrices and occurs before clustering. Several quality control methods are used and should be taken into account. This list provides a, a, a list of all the quality control methods used in the Shunpiker app and is automatically ran using pre-written code. Now I wanna kind of zoom in on one of these quality control metrics and that's predicted doublets because it's often left out of, um, of uh, it's, it's left out of many pipelines. And I, I do think that's an, an essential step to take. So remember when I was talking about the cell encapsulation methods, and I said it was important to keep in mind for quality control. The reason I said that is because sometimes these encapsulation methods capture more than what we're looking for. Doublets or multiplets can occur from cell aggregates or from the encapsulation of more than one cell in a droplet. This results in a barcode containing genomic information for more than one cell. And unfortunately, this happens more often than we would like, and previous studies suggest that doublets or multiplets make up about 5% of the data. And unfortunately, the process needed to take to reduce the number of doublets would come at a high cost and throughput. Therefore, statistical methods to detect potential doublets or multiplets are an essential step for quality control. And failure to address this issue can have implications on the downstream analysis, like the detection of false cell types, it can bridge cell states, interfere with differential gene expression and gene regulatory networks. Scrublet is a computational tool which uses statistical techniques to predict and remove doublets. Now, several methods exist to address this issue of doublets. However, these methods often fail for one of two reasons. The first reason is because the method uh, makes the assumption that all cells contain similar amounts of RNA. And this is uh, just not true. <laughs> and the, the second assumption is that they require expert knowledge and careful annotation of single cell RNA sequencing data, which is a challenge in itself. Uh, Scrublet avoids these pitfalls in a two-step process. In the first step, 
Doublets are simulated from the data by combining random pairs of observed transcriptomes. So in other words, uh, all that's happening is that we are randomly selecting two barcodes and then adding their gene expression counts together and then including that synthetic observation back into the data set. The second step is to uh, score each of the true cells based on their relatedness to the synthetic observations. The idea is that cells with a higher doublet score or more relatedness to the synthetic doublets are more likely to be doublets themselves and should be removed from the downstream analysis. With Scrublet, we're making two assumptions. The first is we are assuming that multiple events rarely happen and we only need to check for doublets. The second assumption is that cell states contributing to doublets are also present elsewhere in the data. Okay. Now I'm gonna dive into the methodology just a little for those who may be interested. Scrublet projects the real and the simulated barcodes to a low dimensional space utilizing principal component analysis, which we will talk about more in detail in a later slide. Doublet scores for each barcode are calculated taking the proportion of K nearest neighbors into account while uh, or sorry, the proportion of K nearest neighbors that are related, that are synthetic, that are synthetic neighbors. Uh, it takes that into account to calculate the Bayesian likelihood. In the example here, the barcodes in the center cluster here are, have more surrounding um, synthetic observations. Therefore, their relatedness or their, uh, their, um, their scrublet, their, their score, their relatedness to the synthetic observations is going to be higher, their doublet score, sorry. Um, and so uh, cells with a higher doublet score should be removed from the analysis. So like cells falling in this cluster here are likely to be removed from the analysis. Now I do wanna mention that scrublet has been tested on simulated and real data sets and has been shown to be a good method for identifying doublets and is available in the Scanfy library. In the Shunpiker app, all of these steps are done with one line of pre-written code, and it runs pretty fast, as we'll see here in a second. Now, uh, normalization is also an essential step in single-cell RNA sequencing data analysis. Now, in the statistical literature, normalization is the process of transforming a variable set so follows a normal distribution. I want to mention that that is not what we're talking about here. In statistics, what we're going to be talking about here is considered standardization. However, in the single cell pipelines, in the single cell literature, standardization is routinely called normalization. So I'm going to use that verbiage here to avoid any confusion. Normalization is not unique to single cell RNA sequencing, but it is often forgotten that we need to normalize at two different levels. There's cell level normalization and there's gene level normalization. Cell level normalization is important because gene expression can be linearly dependent on sequencing depth. For example, if gene expression of gene A, or gene expression of gene A might increase depending on how many transcripts were sampled from that specific cell. There are many ways to normalize the data and it's still being researched on what the quote unquote best normalization method is. Our group is currently working to see how different normalization techniques affect downstream analysis. For now, a widely accepted method for cell normalization is to divide gene expression by the total number of counts in the cell and then multiply that by 10,000. In the end, each cell will be normalized or standardized to 10,000 counts. Uh, gene normalization is also essential for reducing the bias in single cell RNA sequencing data. Unfortunately, outliers in single cell RNA sequencing are common and failure to address this can lead to more noisy data, making inference more challenging, often leading to errors in the results, such as the misclassification of cell subtypes or incorrectly identifying differentially expressed genes. In the Shunpiker app, we take the natural log of all the counts and reduce the effect to reduce the effect of all of these outliers. However, since our data consists of many zeros, like we talked about, we add one to all of these counts prior to taking the natural logarithm. So here's a, a demonstration of the importance of normalization. We can see 
In this first figure, we see the relationship between total counts and the HLA-C gene. And we can see that if we were to, to fit a linear model, it would be almost at a perfect 45 degree angle here, showing that there is a relationship between gene expression and the total counts expressed, or the total uh, transcript sampled. Now, after cell level normalization, we can see this linear effect goes away. However, we still do have many cells that would be considered outliers from the data analysis or from the other cells. And we need to reduce that bias. And we could see after cell and gene level normalization, the effect of the outliers is going to go away. So in our Shumpiker app, it comes with a preloaded example of uh, 2,700 PBMC cells. I want to make the quality a little better for you. And this is really just to demonstrate how easy it is to do uh, quality control and normalization in single cell RNA sequencing. So currently we're at the um, Scrublet. Scrublet's running here. If you've never used a Jupyter notebook before, you can just click on the cell and press play. So you can see we expected to see 5%. We only saw 3.3%. Um, and then we filter and then we normalize. Uh, here. Yeah. So you can see in how long is this video? 47 seconds. We did all of those quality control steps and we also did all of the normalization steps. Uh, and that, that's really to demonstrate how easy and how fast it is to do quality control and normalization uh, in the Shunpiker app. And then once we've done that, the next step is clustering. Uh, one of the first goals of single cell RNA sequencing analysis was to classify subpopulations of cells within a sample. Doing this allows researchers to unravel cell diversity, which can then better inform therapies. Ideally, we would be able to sort cells manually based on their cell subtypes, and there is methods which can do this. However, these methods often require prior knowledge, making it, making it really hard to um, classify and to see new cellular information. This is why researchers have turned to unsupervised clustering to identify cell subpopulations. Uh, as we can see in this figure, cells of the same subtype are gonna be projected onto a low dimensional space and are gonna be closer together, allowing a uh, unsupervised clustering algorithm to identify which cells belong together, which come from the same type of cell. There are two critical steps in identifying uh, cell subpopulations. The first one is dimensionality reduction. And then the second one is the actual cluster, clustering algorithm itself. We're first gonna talk about uh, dimensionality reduction. So you may have heard of dimensionality reduction and this may be a part of the analysis that seems a little black boxy, but I'm, I'm here to tell you it, to explain what's happening and show you that it's, it's not as black boxy as it may seem. Uh, if you're not familiar with dimensionality reduction, one thing that you could take away from this slide is that more is not always better, especially when we're talking about dimension size. So to give an example, uh, in single cell RNA sequencing analysis, it's a common practice to use the 2000 most highly variable genes for your analysis. So in other words, that's 2000 dimensions that we need to worry about. In the field of statistics, we call this the curse of dimensionality. The main theme behind the curse of dimensionality is that as dimension size increases, the amount of observations needed to gain inference grows exponentially. So how do we define high dimensional data? And how do you know that your data is high dimensional? Uh, one of the common definitions for high dimensional data is if the number of features is greater than the number of observations, then your data is considered high dimensional. Now, I know that sometimes this is not the case, and I know there are single cell experiments where we have more cells than genes. However, multivariate dimensionality reduction is still an excellent tool to use because it allows us to take advantage of the similarities across genes to reduce the data to a smaller amount of dimensions needed for the analysis. In multivariate dimensionality reduction, we take information from all the genes and project that observation onto a lower dimensional space. There are quite a few uh, options for dimensionality reduction. Many of you may have heard of principal component analysis, but there's also single value decomposition, TSNE, and UMAP. 
The most popular method is principal component analysis, or PCA. Uh, PCA is a linear reduction technique that projects the data onto principal components. And typically, we are only interested in using the first few components and discarding the rest for downstream analysis. Now, one question that often comes up with principal component analysis is how many principal components should I actually use? And honestly, this is a very good question. In principal component analysis, eigenvalues are a byproduct of PCA. And eigenvalues tell us how much of the variance in the data is represented by that specific principal component. This can then be used to calculate the proportion of variance explained by each principal component. Therefore, the game that we play as statisticians is to capture the most variance as possible in as few principal components uh, as possible. Sorry, the, we want to capture the most amount of variance in the few principal components as possible. Um, oftentimes, you may have heard to look for the elbow in the proportion of variance. The idea behind that is that after this elbow point, the amount of information gained is minimal. However, the problem with this is many times it's really hard to find that elbow point. So in the end, just remember what we're trying to do is to capture the most amount of variance in as few principal components as possible. Um, now, identifying the exact number of principal components that is, good, that, is, that is needed for your specific problem or for your specific clustering algorithm uh, is really still an open question. And some of the research of our group is to work on benchmarking methods to help find the optimal number of principal components for that exact setting. So once we have the data projected into a lower dimensional space, um, we're now ready to cluster the data. There are a plethora of methods to choose from when it comes to clustering your data. And each method is going to have its pros and cons. And the correct method to use is going to depend on your data. However, a great method to start with is Phenograph, which is available through the Scanfy library. Phenograph is, is a graph-based method that utilizes k-nearest neighbors and Lovian community detection to classify cells of the same type. Lovian community detection is not unique to single cell RNA sequencing and has been widely used to identify communities of people who might know each other. And let's be honest, we all know how that works. Phenograph is fast and is scalable for large data sets. One of the major advantages of using Phenograph is we do not need to specify the number of clusters. And this is a significant advantage because we don't always know the number of cell subtypes in our data. Instead, a user must specify K, and K is the number of neighbors to use in the K nearest neighbors algorithm. In general, lower values of K correspond to a higher number of clusters. The optimal number of K in the data is dependent uh, the optimal number of K is data dependent and will change from experiment to experiment. Choosing the optimal number of K is a challenging problem and again is one of the current method focuses uh, of our DARE working group. However, uh, even though this is a challenge, the authors of Phenograph did propose a method for choosing the optimal K and currently it is the most computationally intensive part of our algorithm. Uh, but I do want to take the time to explain uh, how the Shumpiker utilizes these authors' uh, methods uh, and, and kind of get an understanding of what's happening in, in the background there. And this is, again, this is all explained in the Shumpiker app as well. So uh, you, don't, you won't need to refer back to this video. It's all in the, the guide, the Shumpiker guide for single cell RNA sequence and data analysis. So in Phenograph, modularity is a score from negative 0.5 to 1 representing the quality of the graph partitioning. Every time the phenograph, cluster, the phenograph method runs, this algorithm is maximized. So when we have heterogeneous data, increasing the number of neighbors in the K-Nager algorithm will cause the modularity to drop quickly and then stabilize at a certain point, as we see here. Boom and boom. Now the trick is we want to we want to choose the lowest value of k that stabilizes the modularity score, modality score. Sorry. Uh, to do this, authors of Phenograph recommended using the Rand index, which is a metric ranging from zero to one, 
comparing the similarity between clustering assignments for all possible pairs of K. We then want to choose a K by selecting the lowest K with the highest consistency between runs. So that's what this graph is here. And we can see to choose the lowest value of K, so we'll, we'll use K1, to use the lowest value of K with high consistency between uh, runs, we would choose this uh, K here, which is K is equal to 15. Now, like I said, this method is computationally intensive and will take some time to run. And that's why our group is developing alternative methods to quickly optimize not only this tuning parameter, but other tuning parameters used in other clustering algorithms. Now, due to time, time constraints, I won't be able to run the clustering algorithm, but I do want to show the Shumpiker app. And I want the main thing that I want to focus on is for everyone to see what's available in the Shunpiker app. Um, explanations for what we are doing and everything that I just discussed about the clustering algorithm is available for you to read with detailed explanations of what's happening. So starting from the um, dimensionality reduction, or yeah, starting from the quality control and normalization, we, we did dimensionality reduction, and this is the clustering algorithm and optimizing the number of Ks. As you can see, there is a lot of computations. But again, the explanation of what's happening, everything that I explained here is in the Shunpiker app. All right, so just to wrap up everything that we've talked about here today, single cell research is a very exciting place uh, due to its ability to provide high resolution insights to our data. The Cypher Shumpiker app offers researchers the tools needed to streamline their analysis. And we didn't cover everything that the Shumpiker app has to offer, but the things that we did talk about today were quality control, normalization, dimensionality reduction, and clustering. For future directives of our DARE working group, we wanted to develop novel methods to help really drive this field forward. We're going to explain, exp ugh, <laughs> expand workflows outside of single cell RNA data analysis to other multi-omics research topics, including proteomics, spatial transcriptomics, and single cell ATAC sequencing. Some of the important work being done by our group, which I also discussed in this webinar, is benchmarking of current methods. This is going to allow us to really dive in to which specific algorithm or which specific pipeline with the specific, to get the exact optimal analysis for your specific problem. It's also gonna play a role in uh, parameter tuning. How do we tune each of these parameters? How do we select the, the perfect number of principal components and the perfect K for your specific data and your specific question? And then next, um, this one's a little unrelated, but we're, we also have a group working on multi-omics data integration. I saw in um, where everyone signed up and asked a question for what they wanted to hear, that they wanted to hear about batch correction. And that there are people working on this specific problem, not only for single cell RNA, integrating single cell RNA sequencing data sets, but also integrating data sets from across modalities. Uh, so now that I've talked about our group and I've talked about our Shumpiker app, I'm going to turn it over to you guys to ask uh, any questions that you may have, and hopefully uh, Dr. LaFleur and Dr. Zhao Zhao Sun can, can answer those. Joel, thanks so much. Great. So we do have some questions, and um, I think people are, cons are interested in, one, finding where the app is and whether it's public right now, whether the code is public. And let me go through some specific questions. Someone asks, can I use the app to conduct secondary analysis of barcode matrix obtained from GEO? I don't, uh, let's see. Um, Xiao Xiao, are you able to unmute and Bonnie? That was, uh, yes. Uh, yes, uh, I, already, I already answered. Oh, sorry, Xiao Xiao, go ahead. <laughs> so I, yeah, I think, um, um, I'm not sure if I understand this question correctly. So you mean the barcode matrix from um, for the single cell RNA-seq data, right? So you have the barcode matrix and the count matrix, and also the uh, the gene names. And there are three files. Is that correct? 
I'm not sure who asked the question um, if they're on. Asma. Yeah. So okay. currently the app does not do that. However, um, what you can do, this is all an, in the cyber system. You can actually take a, the application, open it, and you can either run it locally and make those changes and updates, um, or you can take it and create a new app that extends what's already there. Um, you can also talk to us about it. We are actually going to be, um, as Joel had mentioned, expanding this app and also creating new apps, and we could easily include those kinds of features um, in the future. Um, but the current app does not. Um, and then somebody else asked if, if you can run this locally. Um, so the whole idea of the containerized running these uh, Docker containers are that you can leverage Cyver's computing infrastructure, which is much faster. But absolutely, you can download any Docker container to your local computer and run it locally once it's uh, uh, available to the public. Uh, somebody does ask if Shenpiker runs on Windows. So, like I, I, you can run this locally as long as you have uh, Python installed locally. Um, it's just a a Jupyter notebook can be run on any computer as long as it has the the Python uh, uh, operating system included. Okay. Um, Bonnie and team, so is Shenpiker currently up and running and available on Cyverse, or is it made public yet, or is it just shared internally within your team for now? I believe that it um, is already public. Is that correct, Joe? I thought we uh, public publicized that. Um, I'm not. I, I mean, it wouldn't take much to make it public. Everything's running and ready to go. Um, we can double check and make sure it is public, and then. Uh, there's also in instructions for how to, so one of the questions was talking about that someone was, was scared of cybers. Um, that, that was what uh, another reason for our, our Gitbook documentation is we, we go through step-by-step, step, um, you literally click a link, it goes to the app, and then you can run it, um, go through the steps of, of running the analysis completely, it takes you step-by-step. So that's that's good. So there's 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 the documentation and then the actual Shumpiker app itself. And the Shumpiker, I think both are are ready to go. I don't know if they're actually public yet, though. I don't think they are. Um, Joe, um, maybe um, could you just send the link of the Git book and also this app uh, to Tina, and Tina can publish um, um, so this uh, app with the webinar. That was the idea for the, that was what I was going to say, everyone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this was all going to be part of the, the post webinar website. All of the links will be available um, just like they are for, for all of the Cyverse um, webinars. So this, this entire talk will have a YouTube video so you guys can listen through it again. It will also have the link um, to the directions as well as the app. Right, I think you've gotten people excited to use Shunpiker. So they're, they're clamoring for the code <laughs> and the app. Okay, one more question. Um, are biological replicates important for single cell RNA-seq analysis? Um, so maybe I can answer this question. So it depends on your um, problem. So for the best effect correction, the replicates will be super important. Um, and uh, if you would like to, for example, remove the best effects and you need the replicates. Um, so that's important. But um, usually if you want would like to study, for example, um, the, um, uh, the immune cell, uh, distribution um, from um, in the COVID-19 um, disease. And uh, usually uh, you don't need the, to get the, the replicates. So depending on your problem or your question. Thanks, Xiao Xiao. All right, are there any further questions? I'm not seeing any in the chat. Um, if there are, 
be sure to post them. Um, anyway, please join us uh, on Friday, April 29th at this time slot, 10 a.m. Pacific, for our final spring webinar. Michelle Young of the Data Science Institute will show us how to leverage Cyverse's Terrain API to build data pipelines and custom web applications that use those pipelines. So if you've got data in Cyverse, but you need to build a custom web app uh, that does something else outside of uh, Cyverse, she's our go-to person. Uh, for more information and to register, please visit our website. And I want to thank Joel and Dr. Sun and Dr. LaFleur and all of her team and to everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. If there are any questions, let's see. Um, okay, somebody did ask, how did you name Shun Piker? Is uh, Anastasia on? I don't see. Her. Oh, so this was um, our collaborator at um, Memorial Sloan Kettering, who was the originator of uh, the Jupiter Notebook. Um, she was the one who named it, and it's from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And that's what's cool about our app is we even answered that question. <laughs> <Yes>. right, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Documentation. Excellent. <laughs> we are reproducible. <laughs> on our team yeah that's right and it sounds like you've anticipated all the things that people want to know about the app so excellent awesome. thank you team very much and we're going to stop recording and we'll see you in a month bye thank everybody. you thank you